All right, so we're in week number four of Momentum. And if you're taking down notes, I wanna encourage you, write this down. The title of this weekend's sermon is God Did It. God Did It. I'm telling you, that has been my sticky statement this entire year, but even more so, we're gonna be making some incredible announcements over the past, or over the next few months, talking about just the faithfulness of God. But all throughout this 21 days of prayer, how many of y'all had some God Did It moments? like you were believing for some specific things, you were asking God to move in certain areas, and in your own strength, there was no way to fix it, no way to heal it, no way to just keep on putting Band-Aids where it needed stitches, but you have to shout from the rooftops, (laughs) God did it. Let's pray, we're gonna dive in. God, I thank you that you give us ears to hear you. We need a mind to understand, most importantly, a heart ready to receive. Show us your glory this weekend so that we can leave better than when we came in. In Jesus' name, amen. So I love the Bible. We are a spirit-filled, life-giving church that that believes in the validity of and the foundation of the Bible. Y'all, if you are not reading the Bible, you are missing out on so many incredible moments. And as I was reading and studying this past couple weeks, all throughout the Bible, you see these miracles and breakthrough, and you see freedom, you see hope, you see purpose coming alive. So many incredible moments. And as I was reading this past week, every time I would read another one of these stories, I would just be like, no way they could have done that in their own strength. God did it. So many amazing moments of breakthrough and miracles. And anytime Jesus got in the way of someone's storm, they got saved, healed, delivered. He literally rewrote their story. A shift happened in their life. So we're going to be looking at five different Bible stories today where God showed up and God did it. This one's off the record, but God anointed and empowered. This isn't one of the five, but he anointed and empowered David in 1 Samuel 17, 48, so you know the story if you're a student of the Bible. David is facing this giant named Goliath, and all he has is a slingshot and a handful of pet rocks. Like, this is all he has. He's just, he's just out here as a shepherd boy, but God, because of a process of preparation, had him take on the lion and the bear first. But you know that day when David showed up as a shepherd boy with a slingshot and a handful of rocks. This guy's not gonna defeat Goliath. But David had been empowered by the Spirit of God because the Goli- this, this Goliath, the, the, he was mocking God, and David couldn't take it anymore. So God began to empower and anoint his life, and we know the story. He defeated with one stone under the authority and the anointing of God and took down and defeated Goliath. I guarantee you there wasn't a person that day standing on the sidelines like, whoa, he's really accurate with that rock. No, 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 y'all, God did it. Somebody say God did it. God did it. How many of y'all, I asked this a moment ago, but how many of y'all have had some God did it moments in your life? Like, you know, ooh, I never should have avoided that accident. I never should have uh, gotten out of that situation or that money disaster. God gave me wisdom or clarity. He showed up and he fought for me. Y'all, God did it. I remember when Jackie and I, walking through a couple of different situations and scenarios, whether it was a medical issue or we were walking through some different things that needed great faith. One story in particular when I was thinking about it this week. So we used to tour. We were in a bus and we traveled all over and did evangelism through worship and we'd show up to different cities and we would preach and lead worship and it was an amazing season. Our two oldest who were 13 and 11, they were babies at the time and we were rolling around just preaching the good news to everybody and so we were a little short on the finances to be able to do this 43-day tour. And I remember talking to the team. We started looking at everything. I was like, Jackie, would you pawn your ring? Like, what can we do? Like, you know what I mean? There's some options we have. And so we're thousands of dollars short because diesel, the, our bus was getting, this is true, 3.4 miles per gallon. Like, you could just hear the diesel saying, I'm out of here. Like, it was just... It's unbelievable. So what we did was we used wisdom. We talked to our board, but we prayed. And then I said, babe, I'm just gonna go for a drive. I get a lot of clarity when I drive around in my Jeep. So I started driving around. I ended up stumbling upon this coffee shop. Coffee's my favorite color. So I was like, I should use another coffee. It's gonna give me the clarity I need from the Lord. And so I go in and I'm standing there in line and this guy walks up behind me and goes, Daniel Groves. And I turn around and I'm like, "Ah, do I owe you money? Because this whole thing we're dealing with right now. And he said, man, I, ne- I don't even drink coffee. This is crazy. I'm running into you here. I felt like I was just supposed to stop. I said, well, man, can I buy you a coffee? 
I said, I literally don't drink coffee, but I'll take one of those fancy drinks. I was like, well, my offer was for $2, but you just spent $9.50. I'll be a blessing, Lord. I mean, so I buy him this fancy drink with the, all the whipped cream and all that. So we walk off to the side, and he said, ma'am, tell me about what's going on in your life. And he goes, actually, before you do, I need to tell you a testimony. You sang on a live album that we play. I, I'm in a, I have a fabrication company. We have a huge warehouse with hundreds of employees. And he said, every morning we pray together, and I turn on that song. You're encouraging all of my employees, and you didn't even know it. So I just wanted to tell you how much of a blessing you've been to us. He said, I, I just can't help but ask, is there anything I can do for you? So I gave him the real churchy answer. I'm like, well, brother, you can pray. You can just, just pray. Because I'm not going to manipulate this situation. I'm not going to be like, well, let me tell you, $6,643.18 would be an ideal thing. No, I just was like, man, would you pray? And he goes, well, are you guys leaving on another tour? Are you traveling, doing any mission trips? I said, actually, we're leaving in 48 hours, man. We're going on a 43-day tour. We're going, to be preach. we're going up into Canada. It's pretty amazing. He said, man, can I, can I sow into that? And I said, yes, you can. <laughs> absolutely are able to, if you would like. No, and he said, listen, listen, I don't need to know specifics. I have something in my heart. He walked out, came back in from his truck, and he gave me one of those Pentecostal shakes. And y'all, I knew it was a check. You could tell the, the weight of the paper. You could tell. I said, there's something on that. Like, that's not a track. That's not a $20 bill. I said, my God, because nobody carries checks anymore. Like, and he handed this to me. He said, I actually wanted to sow this for a long time, but this was confirmation that I got to run into. Thanks for buying that drink. I said, you're very blessed for that. I'm glad you enjoyed that drink. Drink is slow. It was a lot of, it was a lot of money. And so I get out to my Jeep and I open it up. Y'all, within a few dollars, this guy wrote a check to pay for our entire fuel, everything we needed for that tour. Listen, it could have been a coincidence. No, no, no. I walked into our offices and opened up the check and I said, y'all, God did it. And we shouted and we rejoiced. God knows what you need. That may not be in the form of a Pentecostal handshake, but it could be that peace you're looking for. It could be that courage, that perseverance, that fight. The truth is we get so distracted. We, we allow the enemy to bombard our thoughts and our minds and try to tell us you're never gonna get through this. And the truth is when you get in the Bible, I'm telling you, read it page by page, line by line. And the beautiful thing about the Holy Spirit is he'll meet you where you're at. You may have read the same verse over and over and over. I have a pastor friend, he says this. It sounds a little like blasphemy, but I like it. He said, it's like when you read the Bible, it's like the jack in the box. It's like I open the Bible and turn the page, and it's really good reading. And all of a sudden, one day, pop revelation. It just pops off the page, right? He said, when you're reading, God will meet you where you're at because he's a personal God. He knows the intricacies of your heart. Y'all, the Bible is full of adventure and action romance and war and grit and craziness. It's better than Hulu. It's better than Netflix. It's better than YouTube TV. Some of you are like, well, I don't read. I watch The Chosen. I get it. But, <laughs> but the truth is, God is saying, listen, get in my word because when you're squeezed in life, I've said this before, what's hidden inside of you is what's actually, what's inside of you, what comes out when you're squeezed is what's actually inside of you. So if it's anxiety and fear and concern and timidity, that's been what's been inside of you. But when the word's in you, it begins to overflow because what fills spills. Look at the person next to you and say, get in the word. Come on, say, get in the word. All right, so we're going to go through for the last week of Momentum, we're going to go through five Bible stories where radical and audacious faith were released. And God showed up. And I'm telling you, unanimously, I believe everybody who was involved in these stories had to have shouted, to everybody they knew, God did it. Come on, somebody one more time say, God did it. Come on. So a story is told in Mark chapter 10 of a blind man who was healed just outside the city of Jericho. We know him as blind Bartimaeus. Some of you have maybe read this story. Now, he wasn't the first person to be helped by Jesus in the accounts of Jesus's ministry from visual impairment. There was something significant that we can learn from him. What was so special about blind Bartimaeus? Honestly, not a lot. He was, he was an outcast. He was a, a beggar. One thing that set blind Bartimaeus a separate from everybody else is he had audacious faith. Come on, somebody say audacious faith. 
The story of blind Bartimaeus is a testimony, though, of one man's determination to be healed. And I love this story because as I was reading it, I was getting frustrated because the crowd and the naysayers and the people around him, the Pharisees, people that saw Jesus coming, they were trying to silence him like, Shh, hey, stop it. Stop yelling. Stop, stop bringing attention to yourself. Just go hide over there. Bartimaeus, with this audacious faith, said, I can't be silent because my miracle is linked to that man. He heard that Jesus of Nazareth was coming by and thought, I have to get his attention. I don't have the ability to fight through the crowd. Maybe he had heard stories of the woman with the issue of blood when Jesus walked by. Matthew chapter 9, verse 20 records this, that as Jesus was walking by, she fought her way through the crowd. He doesn't have that option so the crowd is silencing him. They're telling him to be quiet. Yet he was audacious. As Jesus is walking through Jericho, blind Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, heard that Jesus was passing by. Again, knowing that the crowds of people that were surrounding Jesus, he would never be able to get to him. So this is what happens in Mark 10, verse 47. Watch this. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And I love this, just one encounter with Jesus. Blind Mar Bartimaeus went from blind Bartimaeus to healed Bartimaeus. You know, we never heard from him again. He was like, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Jesus healed me, everybody. I'm gonna go step into my assignment. We never heard from him again because he was transformed. But I'm telling you, I can't back this theologically, but this type of miracle, no way Bartimaeus was walking around like, I picked up a, a, a bottle of Visine. It's down the street. Somebody introduced me to essential oils. I squeezed some Francie cane in there. That's what my daughter calls frankincense. For all the, where's all the oil people at? It's a club. It's a real thing. It's a real, y'all could afford a Mercedes for how much you spend a month on oils, but, but you know, he had to have told everybody, hey, I was blind, but now I see. Just one encounter with the Messiah. Just one encounter with Jesus. I was healed. It wasn't in my own strength. Somebody shout out loud. God did it. The takeaway that I picked up this week from reading about Bartimaeus' life, in order to keep momentum in our lives, write this down. Number one, don't pay attention to the crowd. He would have missed out on his miracle if he would have remained silent. Some of y'all are so distracted by the noise of what others say that it's blocking the momentum in your life. Some of y'all this weekend, if the only thing you take away is swipe, block, and delete, it will be worth the trip. Stop paying attention to the crowd. I believe that as he was standing there, hearing the noise of Jesus is there, there's Jesus. Y'all see, there's Jesus. No matter where he was, he said, I, I gotta get to him. And he didn't listen to the noise and God unlocked a miracle. Look at the person next to you and say, you're not gonna recognize me by the end of this service. Come on, take a good look. You're not gonna recognize me by the end of the service. And then look at your second choice and say, I couldn't change on my own. God did it. Come on. <laughs> that was a prophecy. All right, another one of my favorite Bible stories is found in Exodus, where God asks Moses to lead the children of Israel out of slavery and captivity from the Egyptians. Now, I love this because earlier, if you start reading in Exodus 3, you see that Moses has this uh, burning bush encounter with Jesus. How many of y'all know the burning bush story? And then immediately after God's like, I've got an assignment. You're going to free my people. Moses immediately did what a lot of us would do and said, no, no, you got the wrong guy. He started making excuses. I'm slow in speech. I wouldn't know what to say. They're not going to believe me. Now look at this moment where God chooses him to go and tell Pharaoh, let my people go. God chooses him. And there's all these incredible moments that lead up to Pharaoh's choice to finally asking Moses and the children of Israel to leave. But then he changes his mind and he gets all of his army and chariots and horses and says, we're going after him. We're bringing him back. Again, Moses was chosen to lead the Israelites out of slavery, out of captivity, into the land of Canaan, which is where God had promised them. Again, Pharaoh changes his mind. He sends the best of the best. And obviously at this point, the children of Israel are facing a dilemma. They're on foot, but off in the distance, they see dirt. They see commotion. They see Pharaoh, the horses, the chariots, and these army guys barreling down on them. And I guarantee you the dilemma was this as they were facing the Red Sea. Now what, Moses? What are we gonna do? 
I guess we should just retreat. I guess we should just go back to where it's not comfortable, but at least we had a meal every once in a while. At least we had a pillow for a rock for a pillow, at least even though it was captivity, I'm not going to risk dying. And I love the audacious faith of Moses who literally went from saying, God, choose somebody else to saying this. And Moses said to the people, it's right here in Exodus 14, 13 and 14, fear not, stand firm and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. Now, I love this prophetic declaration right here. For the Egyptians who you see today, you will never see again. They're like, they're right there. Now, Moses, they're literally right there, barreling down on us. But this prophetic declaration began to release faith. And then he says this, the Lord will fight for you. Man, that part right there makes me want to run around the entire building. The Lord will fight for you. Not in our own strength. We're going to use wisdom. We're going to posture and position ourselves in the natural. And God's about to kick in in the super. And when the super collides with the natural, the supernatural power of God is released. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be silent. Then Moses was given this ridiculous directive from the Lord. God says, hold your staff over the water. And throughout the night, a strong east wind will divide the sea. As the children of Israel were watching and they're seeing this happening, faith began to rise and they begin to trust in the same God Moses had been talking about. Yes, they trusted in Moses' leadership, but now more than ever, they're starting to trust God. Watch this in Exodus 14. I love the Bible. Exodus 14, 21 through 25. Y'all, this is incredible. Some of y'all are like, I know this story, Charlton Heston. Uh, then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. And all that night, the Lord drove the sea back with a strong east wind and turned it, this is incredible, into dry land. The waters were divided. Verse 22, and the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground with a wall of water on their right and their left. You know kids were looking and there was a turtle like, like, you ever been to the aquarium where like the water's over you and there's a shark? Like this is, they're literally walking on dry land and they're seeing fish and sharks and they're just, God is literally making a way. Keep reading. Verse 23, the Egyptians pursued them. All of Pharaoh's horses and chariots and horsemen followed them into the sea. Verse 24, during the last watch of the night, the Lord looked down from the pillar of fire and cloud at the Egyptian army and threw it into confusion. Verse 25, he jammed the wheels on their chariots so they had difficulty driving. This is amazing. And the Egyptians said, the army says, let's get away from the Israelites. The Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. Come on, such a phenomenal story of God's faithfulness and his relentless pursuit to save his people. But I guarantee you, as I was reading this, I've read this so many times. I've even seen, like I grew up in churchy church where they did like the felt and they're like, that's the Red Sea. And then God breathed in the staff and the, as I was reading this, I guarantee you, Moses, everybody who was trusting his leadership, not one person that day said it was the staff. It was the magic tricks. He's an illusionist. No, not one person could have done this in their own strength. Come on, somebody say out loud, God did it. Here's the takeaway. Number two, write this down. Remember where you came from. This is the takeaway from this story. It would have been really easy for them to have just given up not realizing that God had brought them to this place and he showed up time and time again. So now they find themselves at this crossroad. It's easier to retreat and surrender and go back to captivity. But had they remembered where they came from, they wouldn't have panicked because God had showed up time and time again before the Red Sea. He had done so many miracles. They witnessed God sending plagues on the Egyptians while sparing them while all the plagues were happening nearby. But unlike the people in their doubt and unbelief, Moses remembered where he came from. And as a result, it led him to tell the Israelites, do not be afraid, stand firm, for today you will see deliverance from the hand of God. Somebody needs to hear this, I believe this weekend, so that momentum can continue in their life. God did not bring you this far to have just brought you this far. God did not bring you this far to just bring you this far. You woke up again today in that chasm, that Red Sea moment. I'm telling you, when you trust in the hand of God, you're going to have a testimony at the end that said, nope, not in my own strength. Say it out loud. God did it. Come on, I feel it. 
Because when we remember where we came from, when we remember all that he's brought us through, when we remember that he's delivered us and how many times has he showed up and fought for you? I, I don't have a day, no joke. I don't have a day that goes by that I don't have a flashback or a moment where I just whisper, Ooh, thank you, Jesus. How many of y'all have ever had those flashbacks where you just say, thank you, Jesus. You kept me. You restored my dad. You restored that addiction. You, you showed up and redeemed. You delivered. You healed our family of brokenness and abuse. Not a day goes by that I don't. Uh, we were singing that song, Sydney. This is why I thank the Lord for saving me when I was weak. I can't help but lift my hands and rejoice because I'm worshiping out of a place of revelation. I'm worshiping out of a place of I never should have made it. I'm worshiping out of a place of I've had many Red Sea moments and God showed up. Come on, look at the person next to you and say, we're not going to retreat. Come on, we're not going to retreat. All right, here's another story that I love. Uh, first miracle recorded, the feeding of the 5,000. It's also the only miracle aside from the resurrection. This is amazing for some just Bible trivia or Bible buffs. It says, this is the only miracle aside from the resurrection recorded in all four gospels. Matthew 14, Mark 6, Luke chapter 9, and John chapter 6. The feeding of the 5,000, we also know as the miracle of the five loaves and two fish recorded in the gospel of John. It talks about how there's this little boy who's walking around with five baguettes from Panera and two tilapia, and he's sitting where all the multitude was, where Jesus was teaching. So Jesus is teaching. There's this large gathering. It said he was moved with compassion. Begin to, the people begin to get healed because, again, every time Jesus got in the way of someone's storm, they were restored. So this is where we pick it up in Matthew chapter 14, verse 15 through 21. Watch this, verse 15. As evening approached, the disciples came to him and said, this is a remote place, and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to the villages and buy themselves some Hot Pockets and some <laughs> Bugles and Gatorade. Some of you are like, that's in the Bible? Like the message translation. All right, verse 16. Jesus replied, they don't need to go away. You give them something to eat. I love this moment because I'm sure the disciples were like, um, I, have a, I, have a cliff, I have a cliff bar. <laughs> like, and it might, may contain traces of peanuts. I don't know if everybody's going to be able to eat it. Like, No, legitimately, Jesus is like, they don't need to go away. You give them something to eat. It keeps going. Watch this, verse 17. One of the disciples, we don't know who, says, we have here only five loaves of bread and two fish they answered. Now, pause. This is just the way my analytical thinking, I'm like, did you? Did you have the five loaves and the two fish? Or did you just spot the kid off to the side and said, go give him a coin. Go give him a Chuck E. Cheese token. He'll take it. How do you know that they had it? No, no, they just said, Jesus, this is all we got. They're noticing this little boy. Now, I want to know the story of this little kid with five loaves of bread and two fish. Like, he was planning on being there all day. He had no gluten issues because he was rocking tons of bread and carbs. Off to the side, verse 17. This is all we have. Verse 18, Jesus said, bring them here to me. And he directed the people to sit down on the grass. Now, in other translations, if you break this down, this is amazing. Jesus gave directive to disciples to break the people up into groups of 50 because he knew those groups of 50 could be easily reached. Now, Jesus was the original small groups leader. Right? So we got connect groups kicking off because the truth is we're a large enough church to reach a city, but our connect groups make our church small enough to know each other. Jesus knew there's thousands of people here. Break them up in groups of 50 so they all can be fed. He took the five loaves. He took the two fish, looking up to heaven, gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to the disciples. The disciples gave them to the people. They all ate. How many? They all ate. And they were satisfied and the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls. This is amazing. Of broken pieces. Even God's in the leftovers. Verse 21, the number who ate was about 5,000 men besides women and children. Bible scholars and theologians believe, because they only counted the men, that there was upwards of 15 to 20 thousand there with children, parents, moms, and dads, and I'm sure they were counting golden doodles and cats and everything else. Y'all, they could not have done this in their own strength. Somebody say out loud, God did it. And I believe what this story shows us is five loaves and two fish in a boy's hands is a meal. 
five loaves and two fish in God's hands is a miracle. What are you holding on to so tightly? What are you holding on so tightly that you're trying to fix in your own strength? What are you holding on so tightly to that it's taking up space, that it's worth taking up the space it's holding on to? As we're reading the story and I'm seeing this miracle, y'all, everybody that day, hey, we're hungry. There's nowhere to go. How are you going to feed all of us with this magic trick? No, there's no Uber Eats or DoorDash. No way they could have done this in their own strength. Say it out loud. God did it. Come on. Everybody on the hillside that day saw and witnessed a miracle. I believe there's things sometimes in our lives that we hold on to. I said this, is it worth the space that it's taking up? Because God's saying, hey, I want to release what's in my hands, but you need to release what's in yours. If you're holding on to everything like this, then you can't receive what God's trying to download to you today. When we have access, Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31 in the Amplified said that we have access daily to new strength. You don't have to borrow it from tomorrow. You don't have to look back to strength from yesterday. It's not recycled or refurbished. There's brand new strength for you today. But if you don't let go of what's in your hands today, God can't release what's in his. It's easier to try to fix things in your own strength. God, I'm gonna hold on to this shame. I'm gonna hold on to this broken dream. I'm gonna hold on to this fear, timidity, anxiety. I'm gonna hold on to this unforgiveness. I'll fix this on my own. And God's saying, I never designed or created you to hold on to it. We have to release what's in our hands. Because when we put it in God's hands, I'm telling you, it will become a miracle. Come on, somebody say out loud, I'm receiving my miracle today. I feel that. All right, here's the takeaway from that story as we continue to create momentum in our lives. Number three, start with what you have. I love this. The disciples were bewildered, man. They were baffled. God, Jesus, how are we gonna feed all these people? So Jesus saw the five loaves and the two fish as an opportunity for the Spirit of God to show up and breathe and move, and then he did the miracle. And look at what happened. Don't let what appears to be little or small block momentum in your life. Luke 16, 10 actually talks about being faithful with the little so that God can trust you with more. Maybe you know God wants you to start a business, but you don't have the resources or the money. You can start planning it. You can be faithful in the small. Maybe God's asked you to write a book. Maybe God said, I I I want her to start. I I want him to write this book. And you don't have a publisher, but you can still write it. Maybe God wants to bless you with a a car. Maybe you've been believing God for a new vehicle and God said, you're going to need to clean out your uh, garage and make room to, and be prepared to receive it. What is God asking you to be faithful in now? Because wherever he starts, whenever he begins to breathe, just as God provided for the 5,000, I'm telling you, if you trust him, he'll provide for you. Look at the person next to you and say, I've got some leftovers, but in God's hands, it's more than enough. Come on, say it out loud. In God's hands, it's more than enough. All right, story number four. I love this. We've all heard this story. Again, I grew up in churchy church, so I know this story. I've seen veggie tales around this story. I preached sermon after sermon around this story about these dear brothers named Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. If you're pregnant, this is some strong names. Like, look, get over here, little Meshach. Like, I think it's strong. All right, let me set this moment up. For those of you who maybe don't know, I love this. King Nebuchadnezzar is out of his mind. He's a madman king. He created this idol, put this decree out that everyone had to worship the idol that he had created. He said, when the music starts, if you don't drop to your knees and worship and you refuse, you'll be immediately killed. Pretty straightforward for a madman. So we're starting to read here in Daniel 3, but King Nebuchadnezzar is telling Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego just one last time the rules that they have to abide by. Daniel chapter three, verse 15, it's on the screens. I will give you, this is Nebuchadnezzar, one more chance to bow down and worship the statue that I have made when you hear the sound of the musical instruments. So this gong would happen, a woodwind, a chime. People would hear it and have to begin in that moment to worship this idol. If you refuse, you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. This line right here, honestly, this gave me goosebumps when I read this. And then what God will be able to rescue you from my power? Y'all know that lit of fire in Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. It records it in Daniel chapter 3, verse 16. We're going to be reading a lot of scriptures. I love this story through 29. Watch this. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied, Oh, Nebuchadnezzar, 
We do not need to defend ourselves before you. 17, if we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God whom we serve is able to save us. Come on, say, he's able. Come on. And then it says, he will rescue us from your power. And then they get a little snarky. They're like, your majesty. I love it. (laughs) Verse 18, but this is where faith kicks in. Even if he doesn't, we want to make it clear to you. I love that. If he does it, Meshach's like, well, what's the next op- option? Like, If he doesn't, we will never serve your God or worship the gold statue you have set up. 19, Nebuchadnezzar was so furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that his face became distorted with rage. That sounds like a heavy metal band. Like, we're distorted with rage. Uh, <laughs> it just sounds like it to me. The Bible's so fun, y'all. You gotta read it. He commanded that the furnace, he's out of his mind. He's so mad, he's not even thinking straight. He turns up the furnace seven times hotter than usual. Verse 20, they ordered some of the strongest men of his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. Verse 21, so they tied them up. They threw them in the furnace, fully dressed. Their pants, their turbans, robes, their sketchers. Verse 22, And because the king in his anger had demanded such a hot fire to the furnace, watch this, the flames actually killed the soldiers that threw them in. This is wild. Verse 23, so Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego securely tied, fell into the roaring flames, but suddenly, verse 24, this is where it shifts, Nebuchadnezzar jumps up in amazement and exclaimed to his advisors, didn't we tie up three men and throw them in the furnace? His little Nebuchadnezzar follower would say, yes, your majesty, we certainly did. He replied, look, Nebuchadnezzar shouted, I see four men unbound walking around in the fire, unharmed, and the fourth looks like a god. That's amazing to me that even a pagan king noticed there's something different in there. Nebuchadnezzar is walking around like these guys have died. They're not, they're not listening. They're, not, they're in there. De- whoa, whoa. There's three guys in there, and they're like, hey, what do you want to do tonight for dinner? You want to go see a movie? We should post this on Instagram. We're going to get a ton of likes, like, hashtag fire. <laughs> like, this is amazing. No, there's a fourth man in there, and this pagan king says, and he looks like a god. Verse 26, Nebuchadnezzar came as close to the, uh, as he could to the door of the flaming furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the most high God, come out. Come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego stepped out of the fire like, yes, sir. Hey, your majesty. (laughs) Like, You know, this is amazing. Verse 27, then the high officers, officials, governors, advisors crowded around them and saw the fire had not touched them. That's going to be some of y'all's story. Why are you so happy? How come you have so much joy? You should have lost it all. You don't even smell like smoke. Your clothes aren't burned up. Yeah, because I serve a big God who's in the furnace with me. They didn't even smell of smoke. In the natural, this whole thing is ridiculous. Before they stopped it, you used to go to a bowling alley when you could smoke in it, and you had to throw out your clothes afterwards. You're like, I love this shirt, but it's a disposable now. Like, They're in this fire. Their clothes aren't burned up. Their Jordans aren't even creased. They don't even smell like smoke. Verse 28, Nebuchadnezzar said, praise to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He sent his angel to rescue his servants. They defied the king's command, willing to die rather than serve or worship any God except their own. Verse 29, it shifts again. Therefore, I make this decree. If any people, whatever their race, nation, language, speak a word against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. This is where he's still out of his mind. He said, they'll be torn limb from limb. Their houses turned into heaps of rubble. That's intense. Okay, I like this last line though. There is no other God, come on somebody, who can rescue like this. They couldn't do it in their own strength. Shout out loud, God did it. God did it. And we read these stories. And they're not just fiction. They're not fiction at all. These are real life accounts that when we flip through the pages, yeah, we're not faced with a fiery furnace, but what are you faced with? If God showed up for these dear brothers, he can show up for you. I think one of the most amazing things about audacious faith is we want to be delivered from the fire, but sometimes we find God and the peace and the hope and everything we need in the midst of the fire. Maybe some of you have felt like you've been in the fire this year. 
maybe this entire year, you almost feel like you're just kind of trying to get one foot in front of the other. I believe with all sincerity, I believe with great faith that you're going to get to the end of this year and realize your clothes haven't been burned up, realize you don't smell like smoke, and you're going to be able to shout out loud, look at all that God has done. I couldn't have done this in my own strength. Come on, somebody say it again. God did it. All right, here's the takeaway from this amazing story. Number four, trials are not always a sign of God's absence. Trials are not always a sign of God's absence. I remember, and some of you know this story, but I remember when we, were, we had to rush to the emergency room. My wife had had a miscarriage and there was a complication and they decided that they were gonna have to do an emergency surgery and the surgeon pulled me off to the side and said, it's very risky. I'm gonna be really honest, we've lost women before. This is not an easy deal. She kind of was preparing me for a 50-50 shot that this was gonna be okay. I remember finding myself in an ER bathroom, some of you know this story, standing there feeling like I was in the middle of the fire. And I, I, I was frustrated, I was pretty upset. God, I've, I've told the world about you, I've preached the good news, I've told everybody about your faithfulness and your healing power. We all wanna be delivered from the fire. But now they're taking Jackie down the hallway and I'm standing there holding her wedding ring and they're telling me she may not make it. You know what's wild is in the midst of that chaos, in the midst of that trial, the presence of God was so present with me. I felt peace like I'd never felt before. I felt hope like I'd never felt before. I felt the kindness of God overshadowing me saying, she's going to be okay. I remember walking into that room and praying with her right before they took her back, knowing the fourth man was with us, knowing that it couldn't be fixed in my strength or even the strength of the doctors. We knew we needed an intervention. And y'all on the other side of some of y'all are like, what happened? Well, she made it. She's not a hologram. She's right here. She's good. She's right here. But y'all on the other side of it, we shouted from the rooftops, y'all. We told everybody, we, we, go and tell everybody. Like we told everybody, we couldn't have fixed this in our own strength. Y'all, God did it. God did it. He showed up, he heals. He shows up and restores. Doesn't mean though that we're not gonna go through some things that aren't, a lot of things we're gonna go through are uncomfortable. Innovation is often born from being uncomfortable. Think about the guy who invented the Snuggie. You can't convince me he wasn't freezing all the time. Like he's like, if I take that robe and flip it around, put my arms through it, snug him and make up his trillions of dollars. Like it's not even a word. Like I can still hold the remote. How many of y'all enjoy air conditioning? Come on, make some noise. Like it's because some guy was sick and tired of being hot. Innovation is often born from being uncomfortable. I remember when we were walking through that or we walked through some other things a lot of times, if we're not careful, we'll look for the devil in the discomfort, not realizing that through discomfort comes divine discovery of purpose and capacity and greater faith and hope and peace. Sermons came out of that storm. Songs came out of that storm. You know the song, Fighting For Me, from here at Hope City? I, I, in the midst of all of that, I was co-writing that song, and God showed up and fought for us. You should go download it, Hope City Music, Fighting For Me. But all throughout the Psalms, all throughout the Psalms, we see David singing and writing songs about victory and triumph, but there's actually more songs of him crying out to God in a place of brokenness. Trials are not always a sign of God's absence. He's always by our side. David wrote this in Psalm 62, five. He said, let all that I am wait quietly before God for my hope is in him. Come on, somebody say amen if your hope's in him. All right, last story. Uh, is saving the best for last. I love this. Joshua 10. Uh, let me set this up. Joshua in, and the uh, Israelites are facing the Amorites. And it's not going well. They're in the midst of a battle. Joshua knew with great faith, yet a knowing in the natural, that if they lose this battle against the Amorites, for generations to come, they would be attacked again and again. So Joshua called out to and trusted in the greatness and the bigness of our God. And he prayed one of, some Bible scholars say one of, if not the greatest and most powerful, audacious, faith-filled prayer recorded in the Bible. Again, knowing if they could defeat the Amorites on that day, peace and victory 
would be in their future and future generations. This prayer was potentially a legacy move. This audacious prayer by Joshua, answered by God, created an unlocked momentum in their lives to defeat the enemy. Watch this, Joshua 10, verse 12 and 13 on the screens. On the day the Lord gave the Amorites over to Israel, Joshua said to the Lord in the presence of Israel, Son, stand still over Gibeon, and you moon over the valley of Ajalon. So the sun stood still, and the moon stopped till the nation avenged itself on the enemies as it is written in the book of Jashar, if you dive into the- theology and you dive into deeper things in the Bible, the book of Jashar is a book of Jewish legends from the creation to the conquest of Canaan under Joshua's leadership. Poems are quoted all throughout various books of the Old Testament. Joshua, because of relationship, prays this ridiculous and audacious prayer. And this is what it says. Look at this. The sun stopped in the middle of the sky and delayed going down about a full day. It's recorded in Joshua 10, verse 14. There has never been a day like this one before or since. When the Lord answered such a prayer, surely the Lord fought for Israel that day. Now, I love this story. Some of you are like, that's cool. Back it with science. Okay, I'm glad you asked. Check this out. Cambridge researchers, an atheist was the lead on this, said he couldn't back it biblically, but science is backing the biblical account of Joshua The prayer was answered, stopping the sun. (laughs) They claim this is the day of the oldest eclipse ever recorded to October 30th, 1207 BCE, exactly 3,229 years ago. What an amazing moment that Joshua asks with bold faith for the sun to stand still. And even an atheist scientist is saying, we can't explain it, but we lost an entire day. Come on, somebody. He couldn't have done it in his own strength. Somebody say God did it. God did it. Here's the last takeaway this weekend. If you're taking down notes, number five, you can stand tall because the sun will stand still. You can stand tall in faith. Joshua had to believe in the God of the impossible, the God of the impossible. He had to believe him because in this moment, the only other response is defeat. There's also a relationship Connected to this prayer, Joshua had confidence when approaching God that when he asked with audacious faith, he believed that God would answer, and God did. Luke chapter 18, verse 27 said, but he said, what is impossible with man is possible with God. We talked about this last night at the night of worship. We sing these songs, or my friend Brandon Lake wrote this song. It says, I've seen cancer disappear. Y'all know that song? I've seen mental health restored. Don't you tell me he can't do it. I've seen miracles. How many of y'all have ever seen a miracle before? How many, how many of y'all have been in the middle of a miracle before? How many God's done a miracle in your life before? Come on. He showed up when you were at a crossroads. As I read these stories, I can't help but redirect it. Never stop telling your story. It builds faith in others that are walking through situations and trials of many kind. I can't help but talk about the faithfulness of my God. I can't help but tell the story about my family on every flight I fly on. I can't help but to tell the story that my wife is here today because God showed up. The doctor told me after the surgery, I can't back this medically. We expected your wife's blood count to be in the fours. I authorized three blood transfusions as a start Daniel, a healthy blood count's 11. I can't back this medically in 27 years of being a surgeon. Something happened in that room. Her blood count never dropped below an 11. After she lost so much blood like a gunshot victim, I can't explain it medically. It's a mystery. I said, ma'am, it's not a mystery. It's a miracle. God did it. God was with you in that room. God was with the nurse techs. God was with everybody connected to her file. God did it. Say it out loud again. God did it. My question is for you. Maybe you're here today, every eye closed. What are you believing for? Maybe you're here and you say, Daniel, I need a God did it testimony. I've been 
and overwhelmed. I feel like I can't get through the day. I need a God did it testimony or maybe you have so many stories to tell that you just need to pause and stop and lift your hands and maybe there's been a lid on your worship and it's stopped momentum in your life. And you say, I have so many moments where God showed up and I just need to lift my hands as a posture and position of gratitude to just thank him for all the moments he freed and healed and restored me. But every eye closed for a moment, what are you believing for? What is, what is it that you're asking God as we close out 21 days of prayer? What are you asking him for? Jesus, my prayer today is that you would meet us all right where we're at. Holy Spirit, overshadow every person at the sound of my voice. I pray for peace where there feels like there's no way out. I pray for hope in the midst of hopeless places. God, I pray for breakthrough in areas that feel like it's falling apart. God, align it today, this week, for it to fall into place. I pray, God, for marriages that seem like it's over, breathe new life into them. I pray, God, for that, that man or that woman who's struggling with self-medicating, God, through prescription drug issues, or maybe, God, they're struggling with alcohol or nicotine or rage problems. God, I pray today that your power would meet every one of them where they're at. Show up. Throw your weight around the room. Flex and move only like a big God can, like we've read about throughout these five stories where we can't do it in our own strength, but God, you can show up and you can move. Definition of the word testimony is do it again. We've seen you move before, so we're asking you, God, to do it again. God, I pray for miracles to break out in physical bodies today. I pray, God, for diagnoses to reverse today. I pray, God, we'll, we'll redirect and shift all praise and all honor to you, God, and we'll shout from the rooftops, God did it. They told me I had cancer, but it's gone. God did it. They said that diabetes would plague my family, but it's gone. God did it. They said that this marriage was over and there was no hope, but God showed up and breathed new life. God did it. They said financially this thing was going to ruin me, but God showed up and gave me wisdom in the midst of the storm, and he breathed. God did it. Come on, stand to your feet and lift your hands towards heaven, if you would, as a sign of surrender to God as we bring this in for a landing. Holy Spirit, move, breathe, have your way. God, let these Bible stories not just be something we heard and we move on from, but God, let it inspire and unlock great faith today. Now come on right now as daughters and sons of the living God at Cinco, at Woodlands, watch parties, Tanzania, here at West Houston, Uganda. Would you just begin to talk to the Lord as a daughter, as a son? I don't need to give you the words. You just begin to say, God, I need you to move in this area. Just ask him right now. I need you to show up and fight for me in this area. You ask him. I need you to show up and deliver me in this area. You ask him. I, I need you to restore hope in this area. Come on, you ask him. I need you to come and breathe. Put a fresh wind behind my sail in this area. I need favor in this area. I need clarity in this area. Come on, right now, just you begin to ask him. You begin to talk to him. In Jesus' name. Come on, one more time. Shout out loud. God did it. Come on, say it out loud. Now say it like you mean it. Say God did it. Come on. With every eye closed just for a moment. The reason we do all of this, the reason our dream team by the hundreds shows up and sets up, the reason we have air conditioning and the team sets up this stage and we prepare worship sets and moments and sermons are prepared is for this moment. The only reason we do this is to see people romanced to the heart of God. We don't pray prayers for symbolic reasons here at Hope City. We don't pray it out of ritual or routine. We do everything on the validity of the word. In Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10, it says, Confess with your mouth. Believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord. And you'll be saved. God sent his best gift. He sent Jesus to hang on a dead tree for your life because he said you were valuable. Grace to cover every mistake. Grace to cover every single goof up. Mercy for every moment that you've messed up. And then he died. But after three days, he rose up from the grave to give us freedom and life more abundantly. If you're here today, two invitations. You say, Daniel, here's the truth. I don't know Jesus as my Savior, but I want to. I haven't had momentum in my life. These stories were inspirational, but I need a God did it moment through salvation today. For the first time, I want to confess. I want to believe. I want to receive Christ in my heart so that I can live out my life serving 
and living for him. Maybe you're the second invitation. You say, Daniel, here's the truth. I've been living reckless. I've been living for me. And today's the day that I want to rededicate my life. I got caught up in the prodigal life. Today's the day I'm going to get back on track. I've, I've got stories of his faithfulness. And today's another God did it moment for me as I rededicate my life. I'm gonna count to three. I won't embarrass you. I want you to just say uh, with, uh, with boldness, I want you to just prepare in your heart. You're talking about me at Cinco, at Woodlands, online. Say yes to Jesus. Our team will help here at West Houston. One, today's my day. I want to give my life to Jesus. Two, I want to rededicate my life. Three, if that's you, throw up your hand right now. I see you. One, two, three, four, five. I see you. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen. Come on. Twenty, twenty-one, two, three, four, five. I see it. Five, six, seven, eight. I see it everybody come on somebody make some noise just here at West Houston a bunch of people said today's my day all right, I want you to pray this prayer again not for ritual but according to the word say this out loud Jesus come on everybody say Jesus it's me I've been living for me it's not working from today on I want to live for you I confess all my mistakes every issue every stronghold, every poor choice, and all my sins, I ask for your forgiveness. From this day on, I choose to live for you. I believe you hung on that cross for me because you said I was worth it. So from today on, you are my Father, you are my Savior, you are my Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, Hope City, let's make some noise.